Okay. So we have AX squared plus BX plus C. All right. When you have the trinomial in standard form 1, with the equation in this format, we can get the y-intercept. Okay. The y-intercept will be C. Okay. You read it from the equation. You can factorize the trinomial to find the x-intercepts. So you can get the y-intercept and you can get the two x-intercepts. Two very important things that we want. When it's in this format, it's not something that I wrote here. You can add it there. You can also determine the shape, whether it's a positive or a negative. Because there's that A value will tell you whether it's positive or negative. Okay. So you can get three things when it's in this format. But there was something that I didn't say that we can get. Did you hear? That was the turning point. Okay. Only Y axis, a Y intercept, X intercept and the um, shape, but we don't, we cannot read the turning points value from that equation. Okay. Now to get the turning points x value, we are going to use minus b over 2a. Okay. That b they are referring to is that b in front of x, that A that they are referring to is the A in front of X squared. Do you remember the formula that we learned, to, that we used to factorize? No? We used it the other day as well when we did number patterns. Okay? It's negative B plus minus root B squared minus 4AC divided by 2A. Now, do you remember that B squared minus 4AC, that part under the, the root, that's called delta. Do you remember we use it to determine the nature of the roots? Okay. Now, if I take delta out of that equation, if I take it out, I take the root and delta and I take it out, what will be left is negative B over 2A. That's where it comes from. So it's the formula without delta. Right. So you would just substitute into it. You get the x value. And once you have the x value, you just put it into the equation and then you will be able to calculate the y value. Does it make sense? Who says no? Was it a yes? Okay. Right. Standard form number two. You have not seen... No, you have seen this form. But you, have, you don't really know why we had that. Do you remember completing the square? Do you remember when we completed the square? You had a trinomial, then you took out the coefficient of x squared, then you took the b value, divided it by 2, squared it, added it, then you had a perfect square bracket, and then you also subtracted that same value on the outside of the bracket so that the equation would stay the same. Ne? Okay. Now, what we did when we completed the square is we converted standard form 1 to standard form 2. So, back then, you didn't know what you were doing. Right? We knew we used it to factorize because, remember, that, that helped us to find the formula. And that means I can now factorize anything that is possible to factorize. I can get irrational numbers. But... The main thing we also use it for is when it's in this format for the quadratic function. Now, I want you to notice that the one thing that's the same in this one as in the first one is A once again. So, with this format, you can also see what the shape of the graph is. Happy or sad? Okay. In this equation, that P value and the Q value, they are the turning point. 
So you can read it from the equation. <coughs> if, for example, the equation was f of x equal to 2x minus 1 squared plus 4, the information I get from that is it's a happy graph because the 2 is positive. And I can also get the turning point. But now, do you see that the p-value is inside of a bracket? Can you see? So for me to get that thing outside of the bracket, what I'm actually doing is I'm saying x minus 1 is equal to 0, and then I find x to be 1. Do you understand that? Because they are on the same side of the equal to sign. I need to get it to the other side to find its value. And for that reason, you will see, I said there, the turning point is negative P. It's whatever P is, but with a negative. So because it's negative 1, I know that the X value of the turning point is 1. But do you see that the Q, which is the Y value of the turning point, is on the right hand side and the Y variable is on the left hand side? No, because f of x is y. So that q doesn't have to change its sign. It's already on the correct side. So therefore, the q of the y value of the turning point will just be q. So x turning point, negative p, y turning point, q. Then at the second arrow, I say complete the square to get standard form 1, into this format. Then we have standard form number 3. I like the A for me once again. That's the same A as in standard form 2 and in standard form 1. So once again, you can get the shape of the graph in this form whether it's positive or negative. And then these other two things, the x1 and the x2. It is the values of the x-intercepts. I say they have only two x-intercepts. Now, when you multiply standard form 2 out, when you simplify, if you square the bracket and then use the distributive <coughs> rule to multiply A in, if you simplify that one, it will be back to standard form 1. And the same goes for standard form 3. If you multiply these two brackets and then multiply A in, it will be standard form 1. Okay. So, mainly, we have four things that are extremely important. It's the two x-intercepts that I get from factorizing the trinomial. Okay? It's the y-intercept that I read from the trinomial. Then it's the turning point. The turning points x and y value that I get either from that formula minus b over 2a or from completing the square. Then I can read it from the function, from the equation. And then the fourth thing is the shape. Okay, look at these graphs. The first graph there, they are telling you that A is smaller than 0 in all three of these graphs. Do you see? Sad, sad, sad. In the top one, the Q value, in other words, the horizontal translation, is bigger than 0. So it will be plus whatever. In the second one, it's equal to 0. It didn't move up or down. 
And in the third one, it's smaller than zero. That's why the graph moved down. In the second row, once again, Q is positive, but now the graph is happy because A is positive as well. Do you see no X intercepts? It means delta will be negative. In the second one, it's on the X axis. On the X axis. Do you remember when we spoke, when we did the nature of the roots and we spoke about equal roots? Remember that? Ne? Equal roots was when the graph is on the x-axis. So it only cuts it once. On the x-axis. Okay, and then the last one is when the graph has moved down and it's a happy graph. Do you see it has two x-intercepts? Okay, then we take a look at when, um, what effect P has on the graph. So this was what you did last year. Only Q. <coughs> now what effect does P have on the graph? When P is greater than zero, and this, guys, this is so important. Right there, greater than zero, it means plus. Ne? When the P value is positive, so it's for instance in the bracket it says x plus 2. Where did it move the graph when it's plus? Left. Do you hear? It's weird, ne? Because we think plus is right and left is um, minus. But it's because it's in the bracket. Remember we use, when we want to know what P or how it's going to move, it has to get out of the bracket. Okay, but this is now when you look at P in the equation. So if it's positive, it moves left. And if it's negative in the next two columns, it moves right. And the thing is, if you know what A and P and Q does in the parabola. You know what A and P and Q does in the hyperbola as well. And you know what A and P and Q does in the exponential function as well. And you actually know what it does in the straight line as well, except the straight line doesn't have P, it only has A and Q. But this is what I need you to understand. What is the secret to mathematics? always stays the same. So with the straight line, A showed us whether it's positive or negative, and it, it influenced the gradient, the slope. Ne? At the parabola, what does A do? It shows you whether it's positive or negative, and it increases or decreases the slope of the arms. It will do the same thing at the hyperbola. It will do the same thing at the exponential. Do you understand? Yes. Same for Q. Q moves it up and down everywhere. Plus Q up, minus Q down. P moves it left and right. But plus P, left, minus P, right. It does it the same. It works the same for the parabola and for the hyperbola and for the exponential function. Okay. So we have three lines there at the bottom. What does A do? Hmm? Mm -mm. Positive or negative? And what else? It influences the slope. That means how steep the arms go up or how oh, not steep? What's the opposite of steep? I don't know. What does Q do? Up and down. Plus goes up, minus goes down. What does P do? Left and right. Left and right ne? But plus <coughs> moves it left. Minus moves it right. Did 
That is what you must know about the quadratic function. That's the, the theoretical work. Okay, page. Hyperbola. The way you had it last year was just a over x plus q. Remember that. It only moved up and down. Do you remember there was something funny about hyperbola? You remember? What did it have? Asymptotes. Do you know why it has asymptotes? Hmm? Because it's dividing by zero. Is division by zero, or it can happen that you divide by zero. Is division with zero allowed? No. no. So the value where, that you will have where you're dividing with zero will be an error for all of the values there. And that's why you have the asymptotes. Okay. Do you understand? Okay. Right. Very important that it's the same in all the graphs. The y-intercept, you let x be equal to zero. The x-intercept, you let y be equal to zero. Now, very, 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 very important with the hyperbola is the asymptotes. We have a horizontal line. Ne? Which axis does a horizontal line cut? X. Ne? Okay. And we have a vertical line. Which axis? No, did you say X? It cuts X. Y. It cuts the Y axis. <coughs> Which axis does the vertical line cut? The X, the X axis. Okay, now this horizontal line that cuts the y-axis, it moves the graph up and down. And the vertical one that cuts the x-axis, it moves it left and right. Okay, so these two values, p and q, it's very important. It plays the biggest role when you're working with the hyperbola. Something that you can just add, that A value there at the top, all that does, once again, it in influences the slope, how steep it goes, but very important, it shows you whether it's plus or minus. You can also write there a positive hyperbola is in the first and the third quadrant. A negative hyperbola is in the second and the fourth quadrant. The horizontal asymptote that cuts the y-axis um, let me just take a step back. We, I said it the other day as well. You must remember, if you only give a value, if you say 4, then that means nothing. If you just say the value 4 on the Cartesian plane, there are many 4s there. Ne? Okay. So if you, if you want to write the equation, if they ask you for the asymptotes, you must remember this is an equation. of straight lines. So, do you know what, any, what makes an equation an equation? Equal to sine. So, you're always going to have to write, when you're looking at the horizontal line that cuts the y-axis, you're going to write y is equal to 4. Not just 4. And not Q is equal to 4. Where's the Q axis? Doesn't exist, ne? It's the Y axis that's equal to 4, or the Y value. And when you're looking at the vertical line, the one that cuts the X axis, you're going to say X is equal to whatever the value 
of B is. But do you remember we said with the um, parabola, we don't use P as it is. If it was minus 2, we know that the turning point is actually plus 2 because we add another negative. The same for this P, because you see X and P, they're on the same side. We want it on the other side. So therefore, it gets a negative. If the equation was, let's write here, um, Y equal to 2 over X plus 3 plus 4, What does this tell us? It tells us it's a positive hyperbola. It's in the first and the third quadrant. It has a vertical line at x equal to negative 3. So it will be on this side of 0. It has a horizontal line at y equal to 4. Because y is on this side, the Q values on that side, so they are fine, they don't change. But they are on the same side, it has to change. Did I zap you? I zapped you, sorry. <laughs> I used the wrong finger. Okay. Last thing about the hyperbola is the axis of symmetry. The parabola also has an axis of symmetry. Let me just show you. There's the axis of symmetry. Oh, it froze. There's the axis of symmetry. There's the axis of symmetry. There's the axis of symmetry. Do you see? An axis of symmetry is a line where you can fold it or cut it, whatever, and the left and the right side will be exactly the same or the top and the bottom. Okay. Just so you know, you can maybe add it here at the... Um, at the parabola. The parabola's axis of symmetry is going to be x equal to negative p. It's the, the x value of the turning point. Does that make sense? The x value of the turning point. That's where its axis of the symmetry is. Okay. x equal to negative p. Just the way you use it in your equation. Okay. The axis of symmetry with the parabola, you need to understand that there are two. There's one. Do you see it? And then there's one like that as well. Okay. Now to get the axis of symmetry, the one is going to be y equal to x plus p plus q. And the second one will be y equal to minus x plus p, in brackets, plus q. Now let me show you where this comes from. This is the equation, y equal to 2x plus 3 plus 4. It's the one I wrote there at the top. So the axis of symmetry is everything without the a value. There so you have the first equation. y equal to x plus 3 plus 4 which means it's y equal to x plus 7. That was easy, ne? And the second one, you use that line again. But you put a negative only in front of the first two. So therefore, this equation will be negative x minus 3 plus 4. The other one will be negative x plus 1. <coughs> These are your two axes of symmetry. That. Is it hard? No, it's not hard. Okay. 
you can go and have a look there at the graphs drawn for you so you can see what e effect does Q and A and P have on the graphs. So this is when A is negative. We spoke about this. Then it's second and fourth, second and fourth, second and fourth. If A is positive, first and third, first and third, first and third. Okay. If Q is greater than zero, in other words, Q is a plus, it moves up. If Q is zero, that means you will only have the fraction. It will be plus nothing. Okay, there won't be a plus. Then it's your, your axis of symmetry is on the X and the Y axis. Didn't move up or down. And then if Q is smaller than zero, in other words, it's negative, then it has been moved down. Then the effect of P, it moves it left and right. If Q is greater than zero, in other words, positive, where did it move it? Left again. Eh? If it's plus, it moves left. If it's minus, it moves right. It was the same at the parabola. That is why I'm doing all of the functions with you once. I'm doing them simultaneously because it's all the same. Okay. The last one. The one that you don't always feel very comfortable with. Because normally we rush through exponential. Is this one. Exponential function. Now, this one has got something funny. It's got a B. Do you see that? It also has the A, which tells us whether it's positive or negative. But then it has, and oh, and it also has the P. Eh? Also has Q. But this one has got a value B as well. Now that B stands for base. Base. Okay. Now very important, and I want you to write it down here, and I want you to remember it. If you've got minus 2 to the power of X, This does not mean it's minus 2 to the power of x. It's not minus 2. The base is not minus 2. Do you hear what I'm saying? What I am saying is, do you see that one has a b to the power of x plus b? That's because this thing is minus 1 times 2 to the power of x. The a value is the minus 1. Okay? The b value is the 2. The b value is always positive. If it has a negative, it means that's the a value. And if you have 2 times 3 to the power of x, that is not 6 to the power of x. Because these two things are not the same. This is a constant and this is a variable or an exponential form. Okay, you can't multiply a normal number with <coughs> exponential number. Do you agree with me? Okay. So if it looks like that, it means a is 2 B is 3. They are not the same. This one also has an asymptote, but it only has one asymptote. Okay? The asymptote is y equal to q. 
It moves the graph up and down. The reason for this one's asymptote is what can I have? What exponent can I have? I need to have a base. The base can't be zero. No? If I have a base, what can the exponent be for me to get zero? How do I get zero when I have a base of an exponent? Anyone wants to try? 2 to the power of what is zero? Anything to the power of zero is equals to one. Do you see there's not an answer? You cannot get an answer of zero when you have a base and an exponent. Unless the base is zero, but then the whole thing does not exist. So zero to the power of anything will be zero. There won't even be a graph. Okay? So, that's why you have an asymptote. That's what it's about. You cannot get the answer of zero. Does it make sense? Okay. Let's quickly look at the effect of a and b on the exponential function. So, I gave you, I gave you these Cartesian planes because... I remember when I was at school, I struggled. We all struggled with the exponential function because we don't really understand it. So I want you to literally, with me, draw the graphs now. We're going to look what are the answers and we're going to draw it so that you can see how it works. So just take out a pencil. We are not going to get art marks now. Okay? So don't waste time on the drawing. But let's see. Okay. What is the A value here? One. Add there, what is the B value? Two. Okay. What is the Y intercept? For the Y intercept, we let X be zero. No. Okay, so we're going to say 2 to the power of negative 1 plus 2. Do you remember what negative exponent means again? Fraction. Fraction, eh? So that means it's a half plus 2 is 2 and a half. This one is the asymptote. So we're going to take our rulers and our, I'm just going to use highlighter so that you can see it. You always start when you draw a hyperbola or exponential function, you start by drawing the, the um, asymptotes. Okay, so the asymptote is at 2. So I draw it there. And then the y-intercept is at two and a half. So it's just above the asymptote. Now, I will show you here on my calculator. You don't have to do it. Two to the power of... Um, I'm going to substitute in negative five. Minus one plus two. Do you see my substitution? And then the answer is 2,01. So that means it's very close to this asymptote of 2. And it's going to go closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to it, but it will never reach it. Okay. Then I'm going to substitute in positive 5. And then I get an answer of 18, but my space is not enough, ne? So I'll just take a smaller number, let's put in 2, and then I get an answer of 4. So 1, 2 gives me an answer of 4. 
Those are enough dots for us to be able to draw the exponential function, eh? Because you know the shape. Do you know the shape of exponential function? Not. It looks like this. It's going up, up, up very quickly. Okay, let's look at the next one. What's the A value here? 3. What's the B value? 2. Okay, the Y intercept will be 3 times 2 to the power of 0 minus 1 plus 2. Okay, that gives me 3 times a half plus 2. And that is 7 over 2, which is 3 and a half. The asymptote is once again at? What's the asymptote? 2. So we take our ruler, we put in the asymptote. So at this one, the p-value doesn't really do a lot. Okay. 3 times 2 to the power of, let's substitute in negative 5 minus 1 and then plus 2. It gives me the following answer, 2,04. Once again, it's very close to this line. That's the asymptote. The y-intercept is at three and a half. And if I substitute in a two there, it gives me an answer of eight. So I draw this graph. Do you see it's steeper? It's steeper than the previous one. And that's because of the A value. Because, yeah, I have an A value of 3, yeah, I have an A value of 1. Do you understand? It's not difficult, no? Okay, next one. What's this A value? A half and the B value is 2. The Y intercept, I'm going to say a half times 2 to the power of 0 minus 1 and then plus 2 it gives me an answer of 2,25 so I said a half times 2 to the power of 0 minus 1 plus 2 it's 2,25 where's the asymptote? 2 so we draw it in Now this y-intercept is just above it, ne? 2,25. Now if I put in negative 5 there, it gives me an answer of 2,007. So you see once again, very, 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 very close to the asymptote, but it will never touch it. Now, for the value of 2, I get an answer of 3. I will put in a value of 5 as well, just so you can see where it's going. It gives me an answer of 10. So, the graph looks as follows. Do you see now this one is less steep? No? It's flatter. Okay, let's draw in the fourth one's asymptote.
What's the y of the a value? Zero and the b value is two again. Now if I start substitute in zero, it gives me an answer of two. Because zero times two to the power of zero minus one is zero, plus two is equal to two. And if I substitute in negative five, I also get an answer of two. And if I substitute in two, I also get the answer of two. But it's not allowed to be two. Do you see that? So I put in this one to show you that this is what happens when a is zero. That's why they will always tell you that a cannot be equal to zero. So it doesn't influence your calculation, but this is why. So you can write there, does not exist okay now it's going to start getting exciting what's the a value negative three what's the b value okay if i substitute in zero there i get negative three times two to the power of zero minus 1 plus 2 please let me just quickly finish this one it gives me an answer of a half and if I put in negative 5 there it gives me let me just quickly draw the asymptote We'll just do this one now. If I substitute in negative 5, it gives me 1, 9. So you see it's now below, below the asymptote. And if I put in a value of 2 there, it gives me an answer of negative 4. So you see when the A value is negative, it flips the graph to the bottom. It's literally a reflection of what it would be if it was positive. Look at that one there, it's positive 3. And then look at this one, it's negative 3. It's exactly a reflection across the asymptote. Okay. We will do the last one on Monday. Please, guys, you need to know this very well. So this weekend, you don't have homework. You go and study these three pages. Okay.